Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the Classical Guitar Archive. My name is Sean Bliss. And one of the things that I like to do is listen to people talk about guitars and the history of their instrument and what it means to them. So I decided to make a YouTube channel on that premise. My goal for this channel is to expand my knowledge on a classical guitar and archive them along the way. And I'm going to do that by taking a look at an individual guitar and learning about the luthier, its story, if it's owned by someone, the specs and wood choices of the instrument, the measurements of the instrument, and I want to know how these guitars sound like and how they compare. And I figured I might as well share that with, the, um, with all of you. And the first instrument that's gonna get this treatment is my very own 1985 Paul Jacobson. So every time on this channel that we talk about a guitar that we haven't talked about, we're gonna go over the luthier bio. And in future videos, which, um, spoilers by the way, there are a ton of Jacobsons um, that I know about and it will be on the channel. So hopefully you like his guitars because we're gonna be taking a look at quite a bit of them. But since this is the first episode ever of this channel and obviously the first uh, Jacobson that we have on the channel, we're gonna learn a little bit about the man himself. Paul Jacobson was born in Woburn, Massachusetts in 1940. Prior to his guitar making ventures, Paul went through a number of careers. In fact, in 1963, he received a degree in English and German from the University of Maryland. And that degree landed him a job with the CIA and he actually got to live in Germany for a little bit. However, that job is not, was not the job that he thought it would be. He didn't get the sense of adventure that he wanted. So he moved on and he actually held a number of other careers. He was also a railroad switchman for a while and he, for a very brief period of time, sold computers. However, in 1974, Jacobson found his calling through his desire to learn how to play the classical guitar. It was in a Pepe Romero masterclass where he met a self-taught luthier named Rosario Bersenio. Fall of 1974, Jacobson built his first guitar under the guidance of Mr. Bersenio. For a decade after building his first guitar, he did a lot of guitar repair work and customization. And he also built a couple of seal strings and a 12 string guitar. And I never even seen a picture of any of these steel strings or 12 strings. So if you know where one is, or at least have a picture of it, please send it my way. I would love to check it out. In 1984, Paul left his job as a railway switchman to pursue his dream career of guitar building. On his website, he mentioned that things were touch and go for a little bit. He briefly took up a job selling computers, but left only after a month since he hated it so much. And by the way, I used to work, um, I used to sell computers myself, and I 100% agree with him. It wasn't my dream job either. However, that would change in 1989 when Jacobson built a guitar for Pat Dixon. After Pat took delivery of her guitar, a series of events would help propel Paul to luthier stardom. First, Scott Tennant played on her guitar, loved it so much he ordered a guitar from Paul. Then Bill Kanegeiser saw Scott Tennant's guitar, wanted a guitar for himself, and he ordered one. And once Scott Tennant played and won the Tokyo guitar competition, the market just blew up, especially in Japan. Everyone wanted a Jacobson. Paul has since been retired. Um, I spoken to another luthier named Ken Whistler, who's doing work on my other Jacobson. I have two of these things. And he told me not too long ago, he bought the remaining wood from Paul's workshop, as well as a few of his tools. So that's a clear indication that Paul has retired. All this biographical information um, can be found on Paul Jacobson's website, which I'll link in the description box below. Which brings us to the next point. How did I get this guitar? This guitar is five years older than me, maybe even six years older than me, and I'll explain why. 
So this guitar, on the label it says it was built in 1985. However, on the paperwork that I got from Paul, this guitar was actually completed in December of 84. Which is funny because my other Jacobson says 1990 on the label, though it was finished in January of 91. I guess for this particular example, he was just ahead of schedule. From what I gather from Paul's biography, this guitar was built around the time that he decided to become a full-time luthier. And he described in his biography that he would go to these road shows or showcases and he would have his guitars displayed on tables and people would come up and talk to him about his instruments. So I have a feeling that this guitar was built for that purpose. Once we take a closer look at the instrument, you're going to find a lot of fine details that I don't see on all his guitars. Like the more ornate binding, the Roger tuners, the ivory nut, the Brazilian rosewood, the, all of it. Um, it seems to me that it was pretty specked out to show off his skills as a luthier. However, that's all speculation on my part. I don't really know much about this guitar prior to my ownership. So I took ownership of this guitar in January 2017. I've been searching for a Jacobson for a really, really long time. I'm a huge fan of them because my teacher, Stuart Green, owned, well, he owned two Jacobsons. He owned a 1989 number 73, as well as a 1990 number 85, which is the guitar I own today. And I'll have a separate video on that guitar. But that was the first guitar, that was the first concert guitar I ever played on, was one of his Jacobsons. I believe it was 73, it was the first one that I played. And since then, I've always, um, I always related a professional classical guitar tone to a Jacobson. So I've always wanted one. However, the, there's a problem. <laughs> Jacobsons can be hard to come by. On his website, the last guitar that he posted was number 335. So there's not a lot to choose from. And every one is different. Every single Jacobson I've played is um, fairly different from one another. But I was on the hunt for one and I was always rather impatient. As soon as I had enough money to buy a guitar, I would buy a guitar. That's not a Jacobson because there wouldn't be one on sale. Then one pops up, but I already spent the money. I think I've missed about two or so Jacobsons. <laughs> before I finally got one of my own because I was impatient. But this guitar popped up for the second time on Dream Guitar's website. I've seen it before and it was sold and I was heartbroken, but it didn't really matter because I didn't have the money at the time anyway. However, prior to my wife and I going to Japan, December of 2016, I saw the guitar listed again on Dream Guitar's website. And I really wanted to get it. so. I figured, hey, I have the money, might as well go ahead and buy the guitar. So during my trip in Japan, I was emailing Dream Guitars back and forth, asking for additional photos, and they're super accommodating. They're really nice folks. So when I got back from my trip uh, to Japan, which was my honeymoon, by the way, I, uh, I overnighted them a check because they had a cash price discount that I really wanted to take advantage of. After they received the check, they overnighted me the guitar as well because they didn't want a guitar to be sitting on a truck over a couple days in freezing temperature, which makes sense. Plus, I was impatient and I really wanted to get my hands on the guitar. When I finally got the guitar and fell in love with it, however, it didn't have the Jacobson sound. And hopefully over the course of this YouTube series, we'll play multiple Jacobsons and hopefully you guys will hear for yourself what I mean by the Jacobson sound. In fact, I only played two Jacobsons that has a spruce top. The rest of it is cedar, which makes a difference, right? After I got the guitar, I took it over to Stuart Green's house. And we went through and we played it, compared it to his two Jacobsons, and we decided, yeah, this guitar is a keeper. A few days later, Dream Guitars posted or listed another Jacobson, another 1989 Jacobson. And my jaws dropped. It had all the stuff that I wanted in a Jacobson. It had Brazilian rosewood, a cedar top, it had the Roger tuners, the whole nine yards. 
And since I love number 73 so much, which was also made in 1989, I was like, man, this guitar should be identical. And that guitar, by the way, is number 71. So I contacted Dream Guitars and I asked them to send the guitar over. And they did. I was able to make a fair comparison between four Jacobsons and decide which one I wanted to keep. Obviously, I, I, I kept number 35, right? There was nothing wrong with number 71. It's just 35 was a more comfortable playing guitar. And trust me, I tried my best to love number 71. Mainly because it was a thousand dollars or so cheaper. My wallet really wanted to love that guitar. But I ended up picking this guitar. And a part of that reason was I was a little apprehensive about choosing a guitar because it's a lot of money, right? But Stuart told me, Sean, if you get this guitar, you're never gonna want another guitar again. And for the most part, he was right. Um, I still look at other guitars just for fun. I like to um, know what's currently on the market and stuff of that nature. But the desire to buy another guitar after owning this guitar has been really low. Of course, there's other guitars I would like to buy, but I'm not exactly working really hard to save money to get those guitars. Plus, doing this on YouTube, I get to play a bunch of guitars and not have to buy them, <laughs> so it's a bonus. Since owning this guitar, I've given all my, uh, sorry, my graduate recitals on this instrument. I've also played in a faculty showcase at Mount San Jacinto College, which I currently work at, and I gave a faculty recital at a charter school that I used to work at in San Jacinto. So at the point of filming this episode, I've owned this guitar for four years, which is a really long time to me since I've gone through four or five different guitars before coming to this one. And I love it dearly. This is a forever guitar. It's never going to leave my possession. Well, until I die anyway. Um, so I'm going to hold on to this guy for a really long time. It's one of the best playing guitars that I've ever had. It's right up there with number 73. I think number 73 and number 35, as far as guitars are concerned, or classical guitars are concerned, are my favorite instruments. Ask me on a different day, I'll say 73 is my favorite. On another day, I'll say this guitar is my favorite. The one thing that I definitely love on this guitar over uh, Stuart's Jacobson mm -hmm. is it has a chunkier neck and I kind of like thicker necks. But other than that, they're very, very similar as far as feel is concerned. But that's my story with this Jacobson so far. Um, but like I said, I'm gonna hold on to this guitar for a really, 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 really long time. So there's more stories to come. So now that we know a little bit about this guitar, at least from the short time of me owning it, let's go ahead and talk about the specs and measurements of this guitar. So let's go ahead and get the basic dimensions out of the way for this guitar. The scale length for number 35 is 664, or what Paul has on his um, spec sheet for this guitar is 663. 0.7 millimeters. The fretboard width it's 54 mils. The fretboard width at the 12th fret is 63.5. The upper bout measures around 28 centimeters. The lower bout measures at 37 centimeters. The body length is 49 centimeters and the body depth comes in at 10.8. Starting from the top our headstock veneer is two pieces of Brazilian rosewood sandwiching a thin slice of flamed maple. This guitar is fitted with excellent Roger tuners, and for tuners that are over 35 years old, they work beautifully. And there's two different Rogers. There's David Rogers, who started making tuners in England around 1978, and there's Robert Rogers, his son, who joined the business in 1990 and later in 2010 moved to Nova Scotia where Roger tuners are currently being made. Every set that you see on a Jacobson is custom made for Jacobson. The only thing that Jacobson doesn't specify when it comes to these tuners are what kind of pattern or what kind of design are on the base plate. They should be all unique. If you look at the ends of the base plate, you could see the silhouette of the headstock, which is pretty neat. Moving on down, we have an ivory nut. Now, ivory trade was actually banned in 1989 by CITES. 
Which makes sense because the oldest Jacobson, or sorry, the newest Jacobson that I have seen with an ivory nut is 1988. In fact, you could still use ivory today, but they have to be sourced a very specific way. I believe you could use mammoth tusk, like fossilized mammoth tusk, and also um, walrus tusk. So the neck is made of Honduras mahogany. The neck is reinforced with graphite epoxy to help resist warping. On top of that neck, we have an ebony fretboard. Paul does this thing called the twist plane on his fretboard. And what he says is the twist plane in the fret surface creates a treble to base string height differential to minimize adjacent fret buzzing. Moving to the body of the guitar, the soundboard material is made of European spruce. The top of the guitar is finished in gloss lacquer. At least that's what it says on the spec sheet. It doesn't look like much of a gloss lacquer to me. The back and sides is far glossier than the top. And on the spec sheet, it also says it's been finished in a gloss lacquer, same as the neck. The back and sides is made of a beautiful set of Brazilian rosewood. The rosette on this guitar is very striking and beautiful. But one thing to note, Paul never really made his own rosettes. I don't know if he started making his own rosettes and then later stopped, or he always used someone else's rosettes. But judging from his website that he currently has up, you have a choice of what rosette to be used on your guitar. Now the binding on this guitar is made of ebony. It seems like, um, well, judging by the different Jacobsons that I have played it and own, if the back and sides is made of Brazilian rosewood, Paul would use ebony binding. If it's a Indian rosewood back and sides, he would use Indian rosewood binding. And if we take a closer look, it's not just a single piece of ebony. It looks like we have five layers of ebony, what looks like to be a more flame maple, some mysterious blue wood, another piece of maple, and to end things off, another slice of ebony. I don't know what that blue wood is. I'm assuming it's something like um, maple or cypress or something of the sort that has been dyed. If you know what the wood is, please feel free and let me know in the comments section below. Moving on to the condition of this guitar. Well, to put it nicely, it's been played quite a bit. Um, the headstock doesn't seem too bad. There's a little bit of a nick right below the treble, the base side tuners. I that's one um, bruise that I have caused. Um, the neck itself is in pretty good condition. The fretware is very minimal. I believe these are the original frets. The back and sides is in pretty good shape. There's some typical light scratches and. Um, on the upper bout, you see quite a bit of like, it looks like buckle warming. And what it probably comes from is the uh, button from a dress shirt. So someone's played this quite a bit, which is a good thing. But the top, the top has considerable amount of wear. There's a lot of scratches, a lot of dings. It has the, tri um, <laughs> the typical high E string, damage um, near the bridge and yeah, just like a considerable amount of wear on the top but the beautiful thing about this top it's not super reflective and the spruce top doesn't really highlight all these imperfections when you look from it look at it from any sort of distance if we take a look inside we have our label here number 35 made in 1985 well remember this guitar was actually finished in December 84. Since Jacobson has been building guitars for quite some time, obviously his label is going to change a little bit. And there are some changes in his labels. It will be cool to see those changes as we look at more and more guitars. However, on this one, sadly, it looks like there's been some water damage. Most likely from a humidifier that someone didn't properly prepare. Which is unfortunate. It got on some of the... Uh, Brazilian rosewood, but it doesn't look like it's caused any real damage if we take a look at the back again. So that about does it for the specs.
and measurements of this guitar. So let's go ahead and end things off with a playing demo. So that about does it for the first episode of the Classical Guitar Archive, and I want to sincerely thank you for checking it out. Now my plan is to have a new episode out every week, and next week's episode is going to be a 2020 Ken Whistler guitar, and the episode after that is going to be a 1999 Felix Manzanero. So if you're interested in learning about these guitars, going on this journey with me, because I'm learning too, I'm not, I'm not claiming to be an expert. I just love guitars. So if you want to go on this journey with me, please consider subscribing because, like I said, the goal is to have a new episode out every week. And I believe I have about six guitars ready to go on YouTube. So at the very least, the first six episodes will be week after week. After that, we got to play by year. Anyway, like I said, that's about does it. And... Thank you again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care.